as we know, 2024 is already shaping up to be an incredible year of progress for artificial intelligence, robots, but especially interesting, the fusion between artificial intelligence, powered robots. And I wanted to actually talk about this today with some of the two very best people in the field that I know, and that is our friend, Dr. Scott Walter, and the one and only James Dauma. And so today we're going to be diving into the topic of humanoid robots, Optimus, Figure, um, Aloha, a number of the developments that have happened recently, and really just try and dig into some of the more nitty gritty details to see where is the technology today? What are the challenges that are still open? What is the size of the engineering challenge? You know, there's a difference between a scientific proof of concept and an actual commercializable product. And so we'll be talking about some of those things, the state of the hardware, you know, separating out the difference between the brains of a useful humanoid robot and the actual physical body. And so those are going to be some incredibly interesting topics for us to really think deeply about together. And I couldn't think of two better people to have that discussion with. And so, yeah, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to you, James. And um, why don't you just start by talking about the, the general state of where we are today in AI powered robotics and kind of help us to understand what part is a software problem? What part is a hardware problem? And um, kind of just do a, a precursor to how we got to where we are. Okay. So I think different people are going to have different ways of breaking down and describing the state of where we are today. Um, I, uh, my, like my 10,000 foot level on this is we're finally uh, taking it seriously and, and, and working hard at it. I think uh, the industry itself might be in a little bit of a hype cycle right now. It, there haven't been technical reasons why the stuff we're doing today, we couldn't have done two, three, four years ago. I mean, we're doing it better and there's definitely tools we have today that we didn't have a couple of years ago. But I think a big part of where we are right now is that the market, you know, the, the, this, this area, it's been validated and now there are a lot of people interested. And suddenly we see lots of companies making an effort to, to do humanoid robot thing. And I think externally, uh, you know, if you haven't been watching the space for a long time, you might be under the impression that that's because recent of recent software breakthroughs. And that, that's mostly not true. I mean, recent software uh, advances have definitely made it more reasonable to be pursuing this, but you could have started it several years ago and made a, a, a lot of the progress that we're seeing right now. It could have happened a few years ago. Um, to get to commercial robots, you know, it's, we, we break the problem down into like, there's a the software part and there's the hardware part. And for robots, they're both pretty hard right now. I would argue that the really core stuff that we, that you had to have demonstrated was possible in order for this to, to be a feasible product development action, like that, that we actually had all the really important ingredients of that a few years ago. And uh, you could have decided, and there were probably small companies that had decided that they wanted to try working on a humanoid robot, you know, a few years ago. But I, I feel like Tesla coming in and doing this has really validated the space. Uh, and, uh, you know, so now there's much more interest in investing in the space or many more people who are interested in like, you know, working on the problem, not of doing a laboratory demonstration that yes, a robot can in principle, if you put enough effort into it, do things, you know, that are genetic, that, that a human can do. It can be used as a substitute for human in some, in some space of task, but rather that, that we're at the point where it's a matter of, of refining and productizing this. So that's the software end of it. The hardware end, um, you know, I think one of the things we learned from Boston Dynamics was that, uh, that you know, if cost is no object, uh, you could make really performant uh, robot bodies. And we've been able to do it for, for quite a while. But if you want to make a commercial robot body, it's, it has to be inexpensive. It has to be durable. It has to have um, a variety of degrees of free, free, freedom that are a good match to what a human being can do. And those bodies didn't exist. So now 
there, there's very little in the development of the body, which requires, you know, design breakthroughs. There's instead, there's, there's a lot of iteration of testing design variations of getting, getting, you know, building some prototypes, getting them out there, finding out where they work, where they don't matching them to the software, figuring out how that fit is. And then of course there's scaling up to drive the cost of some of these, uh, especially the actuators, but other aspects of the bodies as well can't easily be built uh, off of things that are already mass produced. I mean, there's a significant amount of custom design and there are some things like the actuators that where, you know, they're going to need to be scaled up to drive the cost down. And so there's that whole manufacturing ramp and learning ramp that, that, that needs to be done on the hardware. So we have, so the hardware is in that state. It's basically in refining and manufacturing ramp state and the software up until like up to five years ago, I would have said we were in a space where you could have looked at and you could have said there are things that need that we need for a humanoid robot that we just simply don't know how to do and we don't know when we're going to be able to do them. But that hasn't been true for the last five years. So so the software also has moved into a similar kind of state where it's it's more about figuring out how to use the building blocks that we do have. Like what's the combination of software elements that's going to make you know, make for the, the most useful, performant, flexible uh, humanoid robot. And somewhere downstream, ideally, you know, in the on the order of five years from now, we've got a body that's ramping and is highly performant and highly flexible. And the software is also converging on this point of being truly human functional in the in the sense like what we want are robots where you say, go do that task you've never done before. Here's how I want you to do it you know, verbally, and, and it can do it. And it can do it with a level of, of, uh, of uh, competence that is comparable. It's on the same scale as what a human can do. It doesn't need to be as good as a human for to, I mean, there's so many jobs that do not tax human capabilities <laughs> that we use humans to do. And so the robot can start out doing those kind of things. So I, I would say that's where we are right now. I mean, both of both the software and the hardware are in refinement stages, and we're going to see them gradually get refined you know, and we are, we may be within a year of there being lots of practical applications for robots. I think we are probably significantly more than a year away from the, you know, being able to, you know, uncrate your a ro robot for your home that can do your laundry and do the dishes and mow the yard and walk the dog and all that kind of stuff. I, I, we're, we're still a, a little ways away from that. So that's my, that would be my 10,000 foot view of where we're at. I actually have one question I want to ask real quickly of you, James, before we move on. And that is, you know, is it a coincidence that we see uh, Tesla really moving into this realm with the Optimus project right around the exact same time that we are getting multimodal different versions of artificial intelligence that are potentially, you know, laying the groundwork for having software systems that can be much more unified instead of having, you know, basically multiple different pieces of software you know, to handle audio input versus video input versus the control architecture um, and then have to do, you know, deal with the, the challenges of cobbling all of those together and, and making something that works in a very seamless and unified way. On the total coincidence versus totally not a coincidence, I would put it closer to the coincidence end. And the reason that I say that is because Tesla had pretty clearly made a commitment to this before a lot, I mean, the difficulty of doing multimodality looked really different two years ago compared to how it is now. I mean, one thing that large language models have done is they've brought multimodality. They've, they've, they've shown us a way to do multimodality that is very straightforward, which it wasn't before. Like LLMs, uh, they, there are some things that they've shown us how to do. And until LLMs really hit the mainstream and started getting traction, got a lot of attention, you wouldn't necessarily have assumed that that was going to be a big component that you were going to be able to use in the robot. Today, it, it, it definitely seems like that is something that, that you would do. The, the common sense that large language models seem to be able to absorb from their training corpus uh, and our ability to actually extract it and put it to use, that's actually really surprising. I don't think there were people in this space who thought that that was uh, likely to happen ar around the, you know, uh, before Tesla basically made their big move. So I think 
On the other hand, you know, all of this is a consequence of us figuring out neural networks, right? It's uh, we we basically figured out how to make neural networks work around uh, 2012, 2013 kind of time frame, right? And many of these things are 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 consequences of that. I think Tesla deciding now was the time to do robots itself was a consequence of the fact that we can get neural networks working and neural networks are so good at solving so many of the problems that you really want to be able to, uh, you really need to be able to do well in order to get a robot working. And of course the LLMs and a lot of this multimodality stuff, that's also a consequence of us figuring out neural networks. So these things are kind of moving in parallel, but they're all kind of interdependent also. So it's not entirely a coincidence. I mean, these things definitely feed back on one another, but my sense of the timing is that Tesla had made a commitment to doing the robot because I think they could see the trajectory of the software. Like it was going to get there. And if you look at, if you, if you imagine like how long is it gonna take to get a robot body, to like develop a robot body, get it working and get it into production. You look at that, that's that's not one or two years. I mean, that's a, that, there's a, that's a significant commitment. It's gonna take some time. If you can anticipate that the software will be ready by the time you're ready to go into volume, well, that's good enough. And I, I, I feel like that's kind of a better way of, of uh, describing, you know, Tesla's timing on this is that is that they saw that the software was going to get there and they decided now is the time to start working on the robot body so we have it ready when the software is ready because if the software is working and you don't have any robots you're going to you got to spend 5 or 10 years figuring out how to make them and then get them into production so you've just wasted 10 years you could have had humanoid robots for 10 years but you waited until the software was perfect before you started the factory and now we see people doing the other thing and especially Tesla doing it at scale like i have believed i'm on the record saying i think you really got to go to scale if you really want to unlock the potential of this kind of stuff and that takes time it takes somebody you know to really do the chops and that was why i said you know a few years ago like i wanted to see tesla doing this because i because that was the approach i thought they would take it wouldn't be one of these you know we have a really good looking robot we've built 10 of them and we're waiting for the dod to give us a billion dollars to build a factory so we build 100 of them right and so we're going straight to millions okay james so i'll sort of agree with you on your your overview of it and say that there's always been kind of this chicken and egg problem with what do we need to have first, the, the software and the hardware, and how good does the hardware have to be for the, the robot to be useful, to be able to do useful work. And remember, from the standpoint of Tesla, it has to do useful work in the factory. It doesn't have to do useful work in the, in the home. And um, I was also pretty much on the record saying that looking at the original Tesla bot design, it's like, well, it'll be able to do maybe your laundry, but just won't be able to fold the clothes. It had kind of the dexterity and the capability of that. And I wasn't sure it would be able to go and start folding t-shirts or something like that. And I was sort of proven a little bit wrong, not by Tesla, but by the, the Stanford group. But before Aloha, about a year ago, when, if you remember, they were using very simple telemanipulation with a really crappy grippers. And they were able to do things like, you know, open a can, do a Ziploc bag, also close the zipper and stuff like that. And what they were able to prove is that it wasn't so much of a hardware problem as it was a neural network problem. In this case, the neural network, of course, was a human demonstrating that if you have a good enough net, you can take really crappy hardware. Now, of course, if you have better hardware, you're not gonna be taxing your network so much and you might be able to perform a little bit faster. So seeing the Tesla bot being able to fold a t-shirt wasn't really a surprise. However, it's something that had to be proven. And again, it was they are proving the hardware capability using a neural network, which is not quite the software yet. But again, James is absolutely right. If you wait for the software to be perfect, you won't have the hardware right there. And the question is, is the hardware good enough? We know the Gen 1 was good, but not quite good enough. It was able to do a lot of things. And now they're getting ready to um, get the next version. And the question is like, is the hands good enough to be able to do everything? Do you need to have hands that are good enough to play piano or not that good and still be able to do something as useful as maybe folding a t-shirt, which we know you don't need to do. So they, they're they sort of showing you could do a lot more with the software than you thought you could, and you don't need to have this perfect human hand. You just need to have one that's kind of good enough. The question is where that is, and they're starting to answer that question right now. And the question really is, do they feel confident enough for the hardware design right now that they will scale it up 
to have enough to start doing the training that they need to do to be able to start helping the software. Because again, we're getting a little bit of a chicken and the egg that the software I think can only get so far without the body to put it in to start doing enough demonstrations, enough testing, enough training. And if you only have one or two bots for training, it's going to take you a long time to get the training data. Yeah. Okay. So we're in agreement about that. <laughs> now, looking at where we're going forward and what this other stuff means, in, in consistent with the description that I just gave, I think that what we're looking at now is a number of years of gradual refinement of both the hardware and the software sort of converging on getting both of those things to converge. I think Scott was making the point that there are lots of useful things you can do with the robot today in a factory where you have a large range of tasks at your that you could decide to apply a robot to, and you can adjust the task to fit the robot. So you can start with a somewhat simpler robot, somewhat simpler software, get use out of it, get experience with it, put wear and tear on it, learn how the actuator stand up, the body stands up, figure out you know, what additional features you need in order to expand the functional envelope. You know, and that's turning the crank. So I wouldn't be surprised if Tesla can start using robots in the factory this year for some simple jobs and that that will gradually, you know, grow over time. But I, I do think there are significant functional physical features that need to be added before you're, it's going to be able to do the, range, the full range of things that we would like a humanoid robot to do. And certainly the software has a, a lot of refinement that it's going to need. Um, actually figuring out the architecture of the software, I think even at this point is something that really hasn't been settled on because we are seeing so much um, improvement in surprising directions and what you can do with neural networks that a plan that you came up with last year for how you might want to approach it, you might see a new development and say, hey, we could use that. And you know, which that's what we see with FSD, right? Um, they didn't initially, uh, you know, a year ago, they weren't thinking that they were going to be mimicking human drivers in order to do the planning stack. But it, you know, there were developments in the field. They did some ex internal experimentation that turned out to be useful. And so they were able to pivot and go in that direction. We, you know, we're seeing that leak into the Tesla to Optimus now. And, and we may see more of that. And we may see, may, may see more pivots in the future too, uh, depending on yeah, this getting common sense and planning out of the uh, knowledge that LLMs absorb from their training corpora, that's, that's a really powerful technique. And we haven't figured out yet how to fully exploit it in the robotic space to the extent that we do, that that's going to simplify a lot of other things that we might otherwise have to do the hard way. Yeah, James, you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, some of the changes you might like to see in the, the robot going forward. So we since the last time we spoke, there was only the Gen 1 robot. And now there's been the Gen 2 robot. And of course, these, these new kind of ways of training the robots that we've seen that Figure has, has shown us and that Tesla just showed us recently with the teleoperation. Um, now, they added two more degrees of freedom to the Gen 2 robot, which is in the neck. And the question is, did they really need to add it there? Um, we seems like they cleaned up the design in a bunch of places, but didn't really radically change anything as far as the degrees of freedom or, or move anything around too much there. It just seems to be a cleaner design. I'm not quite sure where they lost 10 kilograms. Uh, do you think they replaced some metallic parts with some uh, plastic parts? Is it possible as far as the rigidity? And uh, do you think there's any other kind of modifications that you would have made that you wish you had seen come in the Gen 2 bot that you think would show up in the Gen 3 bot? Well, where did they lose 10, 10 kilos, right? I think they probably lost 10 kilos in bits in lots of different places. I think they probably lightened the frame. I think they might've done some materials changes in the frame. At the, the lower, I mean, the structural parts that we can see, they look similar to, to the shape they had before. They, read, they redid the electronics and they changed the harnessing. So they probably were carrying a lot of gratuitous, you know, unnecessary weight in both the harness and the electronics because they, they had taken the electronics and just adapted it straight over from the car. So essentially, purpose-built electronics, that's going to save you some weight. Purpose-built harnesses, 
that's going to save you some weight. Uh, especially like if you go to like, you know, in the Cybertruck, you know, you have a CAN bus. If you have a bus that runs around the robot and you have local actuators, it really cuts down the amount of wiring that you need for communication. If you don't have, have to run separate, you know, pair of wires to every actuator, lightening up the, um, the actuators, right? Like getting the actuators so that, so that their so that their performance envelope is actually a better fit to what you actually need. That'll let you save weight. You could change the materials in the actuator. Like, you know, initially the prototypes that they were machining, they might have been using one grade of materials and doing, you know, subtractive machining. Maybe they're doing some additive. For, I mean, there are lots of lots of opportunities, I feel like, for getting uh, for getting weight out of the of the body. And I'm not surprised that uh, 10 kilograms is pretty good for one iteration, but it, they they really cleaned up the design a lot, I feel like between those two, they, uh, you mentioned the degrees of freedom on the head. And I, that was actually, that was a fascinating design change in my opinion to, to, to choose because as we were talking about offline, it's not really functional. Like the robot doesn't need those two degrees. It's expensive and complicated to add two degrees of freedom in the actuators and all that kind of stuff to the head. And robots, they don't need to turn their head. They can see, you know, in all directions at once. It's cheaper to add more cameras than it is to add actuators, you know, to a head. So why do you do that? Well, look at how different it seems. Well, you know, you know, you see the the video with Optimus, like, you know, looking around, twiddling his fingers. It your your human factors have just improved so much. Like if you're going to put that on an assembly line, working next to a human being. The body, the, the the robot's ability to move its head and have expressive body language so that humans around it can understand, you know, it can look confused now, <laughs> which, you know, that's hard to pull off with a robot. You can do all of these really interesting things that, yeah, you know, it can it can nod when you're talking to it and are turning, you know, if it doesn't want to. That's, it's just a great piece of human factors. So you've seen other people doing a thing where they put a screen on the face. And they have icons or little face so that they can have, and that's been tried a bunch of times. But I, I kind of feel like having the thing just be able to like nod its head or you know do expressions with that kind of stuff, and to to tell you what it's paying attention to by turning its head to focus on that. I think that's brilliant, and it I like it. It was surprisingly powerful. I think when you see it in the video. So I think that that was a really interesting decision. That would not have been on my list of additional actuated joints, <laughs> you know, but in retrospect, I think it was really, it was a great idea. Like I'm really impressed with how much, um, you know, how much functionality they're getting out of that rel relatively inexpensive change. Right. Yeah. I'll, 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 jump, I'll jump in on that for a second there, James, about the head, because there was a mystery to me is that if you look at the, um, the role of the wrist, there was an actuator purpose-built actuator just for that. And that's the only place it showed up in the body. All the other actuators were being used in more than one place. And so I was thinking, man, it's like they really designed an actuator just for the wrist roll and not to be used anywhere else in the body. And I was thinking, and plus it had all these funky kind of attachments and things sticking out from it that were non-functional, that just didn't belong in there. So I think they originally designed that to go into the head. And they finally decided to put it there because they, I think, according to the ISIS book, the head was moving in the beginning. And I think in Bumblebee or something like that. And just the head moving itself was causing it to fall over when they were walking. And so Elon just said, get rid of it. We don't need it. And he gave it a bit more stabilization. So now it seems it came back in there. So I wasn't totally surprised. And I'm pretty sure it's this one <laughs> that's up there in the neck. And the one thing is unfortunately Optimus won't be able to go huh? because they don't have that degree of freedom. It's got this degree of freedom. It has got that degree of freedom, but uh, I'm not sure it could do that, which is why I've always said it's going to suck at soccer because it can't do the header that way. Um, the other question that I had James on the, the addition of those two actuators was whether or not it was really more about making the bot more compatible with the movements of the teleoperator because you know like you pointed out earlier a robot has that perfect 360 degree vision but a human does not and so if a human is teleoperating it it has to move its head to look in the direction at least if it's beyond you know where it can direct its eyes to and um so i didn't know if it was really more about the training and the use of teleoperation in the data gathering portion of optimus 
um, or if it was actually a functional need for Optimus itself. It certainly actuating the head is definitely going to simplify certain aspects of the teleoperated data gathering stuff. That's that's certainly true. I, I think you can probably do it. You know, it's not super complicated to do it without that. But if you do do it, you you know, you simplify your data gathering to some extent because you can just have a camera and the operator, it can track the, the operator's head to the extent that they can do that. That the Because as Scott said, it doesn't have all the flexibility. I mean, human beings, we have, you know, nine joints <laughs> in our neck <laughs> and each of them is, has like two DOF, at least two DOF, maybe three DOF, depending on, you know, how you do that. So human necks are pretty flexible, but uh, they did a pretty good job of mimicking human movement with the two. I, I thought that the, that what they were doing was like the super spin, super spinatus type of wrist thing where they've got, you know, the heads mounted on like a ball joint and they have two uh, actuators that are differentially driving the head to get the left, right, up, down motion as a pair. And the head's really light, so you don't need much power in it. Like, I would be surprised if it was this, if it was the same, maybe it is the same actuator. I don't know. The, um, but it, like, I would have thought that the head actuator was yet another actuator that they weren't already using somewhere else in the body, because it seems like the, the only other super lightweight power profile ones are the ones, the fingers, and those probably wouldn't be, I mean, you could spring the head and then use the finger things if you wanted to. Maybe that would do it. Um, I know it's in, we, we can't see, right? We haven't seen any details on, on how they're doing the head. But uh, no, I think, Hans, you make a good point. There is a synergy there between being able to turn the head and, uh, and sort of being able to directly take data from a human-operated uh, teleoperation rig and, and train the robot with it. So maybe that's useful, too. Yeah, I think the, the only reason I'm thinking they went ahead and used um, those two actuators is because the original design showed that for the neck, that they had two actuators up there to be able to make it go back and forth. But you're right, we can't see enough, and that would be another way of being able to do it is, is by making it almost like a, a little Stuart platform that's able to move it, itself around in almost any way. Um, but again, it could be that that would mean they'd have to come up with yet another actuator unless... I mean, that could also be a good guess. Maybe the actuators and the fingers could be used uh, for that. So for some reason, they decided to move that way. And if you remember, when we did see the one video of the teleoperator, um, he was moving his head a lot. So that from, from last February, when the blocks were being done and we were able to see the headset on there, the operator was not able to keep his head fixed. It was constantly moving around. Yet you could see the bot when it was doing the same thing. Its head was fixed and it was not mimicking that. And so they may have decided that, again, just for teleoperation, it was very important to do it. Plus, you get the other benefits, like you say, is that everyone else around there can sort of tell what the robot is doing. Yeah, I think the body, the human factors thing was, I mean, I had this, I, I get the impression other people had this expression too. You know, when we saw that little, that last teaser video for the most recent generation of, of the robot, and that that motion where like it's looking around, you know, and twiddling its fingers, it's so human, it's it's crazy. And a huge chunk of that is the head movement, right? That that That's really what, you know, if it had been doing that, imagine doing the same motion without the, the, the fingers, it's not nearly as impressive. Uh, it's not as nearly as kind of, um, it's not a gotcha moment. It doesn't, it doesn't get you in the same way when you do that. Like, that's just like, I was, I was really impressed with how powerful the gesture of just turning that, being able to turn your head and indicate interest. And, you know, because we do use, you know, in a very natural way, the attitude of our head to, 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 as, as a communication mechanism, like it, it's almost as good as facial expressions, right? which like anybody who's seen a Disney Pixar movie knows it doesn't take very many degrees of freedom to get a lot of expression out of something, right? If they can make a, if they can make a desk lamp, you know, if they can give it a personality, well, you can do that with a robot too, but motion really helps, right? It really does. One of the things that I've heard is that, you know, part of the reason that some of the more advanced mammals have white around the edges of their eyes instead of, you know, reptiles where it's pretty much a solid color is actually to give other members of you know that community the ability to track where your attention is by seeing the direction that your eyes are pointed there's a lot of things that we use for nonverbal communication and where our attention is directed is one of those things uh, we actually do read a lot into maybe you know subconsciously most of the time 
Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if we end up getting any additional things that are added to the Optimist bot that allow us to have more more intuitive communication in a nonverbal way with it. Yeah, I think that that attention direction thing is it's clearly a really big component of human communication. I I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Sometimes sit down, Scott, try to work out the numbers of like, how much resolution do you need to be able to tell if someone who's 30 feet away from you is looking at you or not? Because if try this sometime when you're at a party or something like that, look across the room, look at somebody who's 30 feet away and and ask yourself who that person is looking at. Because whether they're looking at you, the person next to you, somebody six feet over, something like that, it's it's amazing how you can tell even in a crowded room, even with lots of targets, even with somebody who's really far away, exactly where they're looking. And part of it is that the contrast between the sclera and the cornea, right? That that we can, you know, that that that's a trick. But uh, but humans, like that's how important that is to us. Like as we our our brains dedicate a significant amount of resources to to tracking what the attention of other humanoids in our environment is. That, that helps us understand the dynamics of a situation really well. And of course, head posture is, that's a component of it too. Like being able to estimate, that this is another thing humans are really good at. You can tell to a very, very fine degree exactly what direction somebody's face is pointing, like where somebody's nose is pointing. Like you can, you can tell that. Uh, a long way away. And because it's important communication and line workers, people working with robots, they'll be able to make use of that in a really natural way. You know, now that the head can move around doing this, doing the trick with the eyes is probably a little bit more complicated because you can't mimic. It's hard to mimic the movement of human eyes and the exact geometry and all the stuff that you would need to do with that. But the head, that's almost a gimme. And, and, uh, and it was great. Uh, like I'm very impressed that they realized that and were immediately able to make such great use of it. Well, if you look at what they also added to the head there, uh, that, that sort of LED that's outlining everything almost looks kind of like a beard that's going around. Um, is that going to be a way of being able to also communicate a little bit? So having that feature makes it a lot, like imagine if they just made the whole head black and so all you had was the outline, then telling the direction that it's facing is a lot harder, right? You want some markings, but you don't, if you put markings on the face, it's a little bit weird. So instead what they did was they, they put a perimeter around it and it's illuminated, right? It really stands out. So, and that helps your eye. And it's a, it's a thin line too. Like it's much easier for your eye to tell. Like if they had colored the whole side of the head or something, it would be harder to tell. But because you have that irregular shaped line on the head, it makes it really easy to by eye to discern like what direction the head is facing. So yeah, I, I think that it's functional. I mean, it, it, it looks nice too. It's a nice design element as well. And I imagine they'll have color coding as well. That um, green for operational or, or red, stay away. I'm in a bad mood, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yellow, black, blinking. <laughs> Gone berserk. Um, sure. Yeah. You could do all, or you could, you know, it could be the way you tell them apart too. If you've got three or four, you know, if you're working in a room with a bunch of Optimine, they all look exactly the same. There will be situations where that is a little inconvenient. You know, if you've got multiple ones working different stations, crossing paths and that kind of stuff for for human operators to be able to identify them by, you know, an individual one or by category. Like what job is this guy doing right now that that uh, that could also be really useful. They'll, I mean, I imagine they'll probably be all this kind of stuff. Maybe they'll wear T-shirts, too. <laughs> with logos. <laughs> <laughs> Jerseys with a number on the back. Yep. 42. Get over here. I bet they'll get names. It, you know, just because. So Scott, I was trying to make the case earlier and I, I asked uh, Hans to queue up a couple of different videos um, to support my contention that the, that, the, that, the, that the essential building blocks of what we need to get, uh, to be able to like train robot bodies to have the kind of sort of functional grace, dexterity and whatnot that human beings have, that 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 the, that the building blocks of that we've had for a while. And I had queued up a couple of videos here that just kind of look at what's been done, say over the last several years in various different ways. So this one, this video, the Aloha robot video, this was, you were talking about it before. It, it's the, the Stanford lab basically demonstrating you can really do a lot with just a pincher robot. Uh, 
you know, essentially you can, your hardware can be pretty limited and you can still do pretty amazing things uh, with it. But there are lots of things that you can't do with that. Like I'm shocked that these guys figured out how to crack an egg with a pincher robot, you know, and not smash the egg and get good. Re I mean, I don't know how many takes did it take to get this? I don't know. But the fact that they can do it at all is pretty impressive or handling a spatula, you know, as a, you know, it handling a spatula is kind of tough. It, they're definitely designed for human hands. I can imagine spatulas that this robot wouldn't be able to use just because of their shape. And there are lots of things like one of the examples I had was like, well, try to use a power drill with a, with a tweezer bot, right? Like that's just not going to happen. There are all kinds of human tools that you can't do with this. Um, and a lot of the movements that this robot's doing, they're not going to be, you're not going to train this by mimicking people, right? You're going to gather some data with a human teleoperator or whatnot. You're going to do a lot of reinforcement learning training. Then you're going to have a planner and whatnot. And you could get something pretty functional, but this is not going to be a humanoid robot, right? Uh, the human, to be a drop-in replacement for a human, you need a set, you need a range of motion, degrees of freedom, grip strength and whatnot that basically match physically what a human being could do. Um, Hans, do you want to pull up the, let's look, pull up the deep mind video. Let's talk about that one a minute. Okay. Um, so this was, this, this thing was at, this actually was a breakthrough. So this was a uh, deep mind. They started out basically training, showing that you could do reinforcement learning with Atari games. So that was a cover story in nature magazine uh, sometime back, it was a really big breakthrough, like being able to do reinforcement learning for training against like Atari games was really tough. Well, it, once they had done that and they had these long time horizon training things where the reason you want to use reinforcement learning, you use it in situations where the reward, you have to do many operations and then you get a reward after many, many steps. And you have this pro you have this, uh, essential challenge of like, which of the many, many things I did made it work. And one of the processes that has this is like trying to get a humanoid robot to stand up or walk or run or do parkour or whatever that that, you know, your reward is staying up, but you do lots and lots of things in the process of staying up. So figuring out how to train something like which of the many things I did allowed me to stand up, allowed me to jump across the gap. Why not? That's really tough. Reinforcement learning was a natural fit for this. And this, this uh, paper, this is a, this is DeepMind basically demonstrating that it works for robots. And that was a really big deal. Like we did not know how to get reinforcement learning. We, we weren't even sure you could use reinforcement learning to do this kind of problem. So, so, so that was a really big deal. But once we knew that you could, that you could do that, all of a sudden, you know, doing it well was now a matter of refining the process. Uh, so that's one thing about this. This was a number of years ago. And so this, this really critical building block for robots we've had for quite a while. But one thing I want to draw your attention to is that these things, when they're trained, their goal is just like, you can see this thing is running and it's got its hand standing up and it's pumping its fist and whatnot. That's not functional. Like, why is it doing that? It might as well. It doesn't matter to the robot. It's not trying to be efficient. So it doesn't look like a human being. It looks kind of goofy. So that, that has some costs to it. Like in addition to training it to be able to do the motion, you also wanted to train it to be efficient. People tried just training for efficiency and you do get more hum, more realistic looking. I mean, things that don't look quite as crazy and that don't have lots of extraneous mo movement built into them. But it, but it turned out that there was a more straightforward way to like get really good stuff and actually get it to converge faster. So Hans, you wanna pull up the, the deep mimic? Okay. So let's uh, show us some spin kicks. So here's cartwheels, backflips. Okay, so this this is also using reinforcement learning to train a robot body. Now, why does it look so great? Well, the way that this is done is you do motion capture on a human being doing some kind of action. Incidentally, this work was done for training video game characters. It wasn't used for training robots, but you can use it to train robots. And it demonstrated something which is a really powerful technique, which is you do motion capture on a reference, you know, creature, a human being for a humanoid robot, a dog for a dog robot or, or whatever. You do motion capture on it. And now when you do your reinforcement learning, instead of giving it the simple goal of just like, you know, you know, keep your head above ground and move forward or, you know, move the center of your body closer to the target or something like that. Instead of some really simple goal like that, you give it that goal, but you also, you give it extra points 
to the extent that it can keep its body points, like its elbows and knees and whatnot, in the same configuration relative to its body as a human being. So it's mimicking a, hum a human, right? And this is kind of the core version of all the mimic stuff that we see getting done today. But it, it illustrates a couple of aspects of why this is so powerful. One of them is you automatically get efficiency because you're imitating an efficient gait. So instead of having to discover and solve for efficiency separately, which you can do, but it's complicated. It can be time, it can be consuming and you won't get human like behavior out of it because what's efficient for a robot and what's efficient for a human are different. A lot of times we want the robot to move like a human being because of the body language thing. And also a lot, we, there are a lot of tasks in the real world where we know how to do them really well because humans have figured it out. And by watching a human do it, you get a very efficient, very, you know, a very well structured breakdown of the task. And so just mimicking a human directly is, is a, is a pretty powerful thing, right? Okay. So this is also an old paper. This is from uh, five years ago now, right? So this is not brand new stuff. This is also, this is work that's mostly done on a PC with a GPU. It's done using a little bit of motion capture. It doesn't take a lot of resources to do this stuff. And the technique has been around for a while. But look how amazing these motions are. They're incredibly human realistic. And then they demonstrated, see, this is an atlas. This is the same motion mapped onto an atlas. So why can you do this with the weight distribution being so different? That's because it's trained in reinforcement learning. The fundamental training is still reinforcement learning. It's just that instead of giving it a simple goal of just move close to the target and do it with whatever floppy limbs you want, you get extra points for having your elbows and knees and hips do what the human did in the motion capture. So this is a so this is also a technique that we've had for a while. I would when I saw this paper five years ago, I thought we're done. <laughs> like, this is so good. And, you know, one of the things that we still didn't quite have at this point was the sim to real thing, like getting something working in simulation, then putting it on a real robot body. That was a challenge. It's still not easy. But a, couple, but a year or so after this paper came out, ETH demonstrated a super beautiful hack for how to get this, which is basically... But you know, you train a robot, you train your robot in simulation, and then you have your real robot. And the real robot is different in some significant, in some important ways. The motors have a little more torque, the weight distribution, you, you can never perfectly mimic it in simulation. And the, and the thing is balance, especially bipedal like locomotion, is su such a fine skill that if you're off by more than a little bit, uh, then, you know, it, it just like, it completely breaks. So how do you map those two between them? And what ETH did was basically, they figured out you could use a neural network as a shim layer, right? So you, uh, you essentially, you, 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 you train, you train a neural network to just flop the limbs around or something like that. And it predicts how the limbs should flop around. Then you, you run that in the actual body and then you train a shim layer until it can make the limbs move exactly the way the limbs flop around in simulation. Now you have a shim layer that captures the difference between your imaginary body in simulation and the actual body. And it turns out you pop that shim layer into the real robot, and then you can take what you trained in simulation, drop it on the robot, and it works, right? <laughs> and that was beautiful. It, it turns out to be a pretty straightforward hack. They demonstrated this, like I said, like five years ago. And since then, we've known that, that you can train reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning works for training robots. We have learned you can get really efficient and very human gates by mimicking humans. That was something that we've known for a few years. And then we now know not just the ETH way, but other people have demonstrated other ways of, of closing the sim to real gap. So you can train in simulation, move it to a robot. So we had all the essential ingredients some years ago for being able to use a neural network to control the body. Now, you still don't see people doing this. Like, why don't why doesn't Optimus walk as well as this as this mannequin does, right? And I think the the, the short answer for that is robots are expensive, and experimenting with them breaks them, <laughs> right? So we're still at a stage, and this is one of this is a side effect of the fact that these robots are precious. They take a long time to build. They're you know get them working that kind of stuff. If Optimus only cost ten thousand dollars, they would be a lot more willing to maybe break a few Optimi sorting out a software problem. But the, at the point that they're at right now, they don't want to do that. So instead of of using the techniques that we're seeing demonstrated here to like get really impressively flexible and dynamic, you know fast. You were talking, Scott, you were talking about how fast they walk. Instead of doing that, 
they're still using extremely conservative systems for doing the locomotion because they don't want to break any more robots than they have to at the point that they're in the game right now. And a lot of the stuff that they want to do right now, they don't really need the super fancy locomotion to get it. Right now, Optimus' legs are just a way of moving his torso around the factory. And almost all the stuff that they expect him to do in the short run is going to be like either just using those legs to move from one spot to another or just a platform for the upper body to do the stuff. So Tesla, at this point at least, has kind of broken the problem down into two chunks. They've separated the locomotion op out and, and so that they can do that in a pretty conservative manner where it is. And that's why Optimus' walking still looks so robotic. It is robotic, right? They, they haven't moved over to like really doing the human mimic, you know, super efficient thing. They're being very conservative with that. But the upper body, it's safer to go with, with, uh, with, with mimicking human beings. Uh, on that kind of thing. And so we're seeing them do that. And especially for like block sorting and whatnot, there's a ton of stuff that you just need to be able to do with the with the neural network on that. So I think that was the stuff. So we we had a couple of other ones. There's that that ETH demo of the the massively parallel reinforcement learning for quadrupeds. So when we first started doing reinforcement learning training, one of the challenges was that the reinforcement learning training, it could be really time consuming. I mean, that's one of the things about reinforcement learning is that the, fee, the the training signal is relatively weak. So you have to train for a really long time before you accumulate enough information to be able to really have trained the robot really well. But people started sorting out different ways of doing this. And this is another uh, ETH uh, paper that I like. They, they do a good job of doing great demos for their papers, but they basically they started designing RL environments that were specifically designed. So this is basically a chunk of code that runs on an NVIDIA GPU. And what they do is they just put like 1,024 robots in the same space and they give it this complicated environment that it has to work over. And all of these robots have, you know, a set of goals that they just do and the goal changes and whatnot. So, they're, so essentially they demonstrated that you can do this massively parallel. Uh, so like all, because, it's not really a thousand different robots. It's really one robot control network that's running on a thousand different robots. And that became really efficient. This is them demonstrating running exactly the trained thing on an actual robot body. So here the, the human is being the harness for going up and down the stairs. But you know, this quadruped, it learned to deal with these blocks. It learned to go up and down stairs, learned all that stuff in just in simulation. And then they put it on a real robot body. They're doing, they put that shim layer in. That's one of their tricks, right? And now the real robot can basically do the stuff that, that it was trained to do. And incidentally, I think there's a stat in this where they only do 20 minutes of training from scratch on one GPU to like train the neural network for the that's, that controls a robot body for this quadruped. So anyway, once again, supporting the notion that like we've known how to do this. The, the guts of it, you know, the essential techniques. We've known it was possible. And we've known approximately how you could do it for a while. And so now we're, you know, as far as, as controlling the body in a natural way, like using a neural network to get the kind of grace and flexibility that, an, that animals enjoy, because animals have powerful neural networks to do that. We know basically that this can be done. We know approximately how to do it. And now it's a matter of like doing the hard work of actually doing it. That is, this is this is I would argue that that is where we are uh, for the for the body control stuff. Now planning is separate. Planning is a separate complicated thing. Planning for humanoid robots is 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 another is you know it's another thing that kind of needs to be resolved to a first approximation as they did with FSD, you can get a lot of traction just using using non-neural network planning, using the traditional kind of, you know, good old fashioned AI sort of methods for, for planning. And they have, you know, we do see them doing that, that uh, we also see them. We know that there are lots of kinds of planning that are really, that neural network uh, techniques are really useful for. Oh, this was the efficiency uh, demo. So this, uh, this is a paper, this actually predates neural networks. In this design, uh, what this researcher did was they put they put skeleton they put muscles on skeletons in simulation and they solved for efficient gates and what they demonstrated with this was that well first of all one thing I take away from it as somebody who was looking at robots the robotics that wasn't that wasn't the goal of the person who did this work was that was that natural gates and efficient gates are basically the same thing. That is, it's no coincidence that humans look the way they do when they're walking or that 
dogs do or that birds do, right? The motions that we have are a natural consequence of the shape and connectivity of our skeleton. The fact that we use muscles, right? Because muscles are a certain kind of actuator. They have certain properties. Like for instance, you can, muscles can pull, but they can't push, right? So you have to have antagonist muscles, which are sometimes connected in different ways. And so the, the motion that comes out of that is a consequence of the muscles, the skeleton, and 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 the and efficiently achieving some kind of target. So this is something that we've also known for a while. We've known efficient numerical techniques for getting you know very natural movement, very natural motion out of arbitrary devices, right? Like you can see the great variety of of structures that that this technique is applying to. They're also this is being simulated in a in a in a in a physics simulation, right? So these things are being trained to do what they do in an environment. Those blocks, incidentally, they're just to perturb the sim the the thing under simulation. Like it has to be more robust if it can keep walking while you're throwing bricks at it, right? Yeah, I think that was all the videos, right? I think there's an NVIDIA character animation one also in here. This is it. In this vid in this segment, by the way, what they're doing is they're they're demonstrating how um, it uh, essentially you can um, you can train for a particular task, but you sometimes you want the motion to be conditioned on an intermediate instruction. So, for instance, what that arrow was doing was basically demonstrating it was an intermediate instruction. Now go this way. Now go that way. And the and the the system had the the, the algorithm that was controlling the body was flexible enough that not only could it walk straight and walk sideways, but it could interpolate smoothly between those two if you needed to, or it can, it can walk. You don't have to teach it to run at every different pace. You don't have to teach it, teach it to run on every different ground. You can condition motion actions that you've, that you've trained on, on other inputs. So in the NVIDIA one here, this is another one where I wanted to highlight. So NVIDIA is actually doing this mimicking kind of a different way. They're using a physics simulation. There is some human mimicking going into this, but this is another demonstration. Now, uh, NVIDIA has a tool, a commercially available tool that you can just get. You can download this for free, actually, if you buy NVIDIA stuff, if you if you use their GPUs and stuff. They have, they have kits that you can just basically find. Now, once again, these are for training video game characters because robots are expensive, video game characters are cheap, and there's a big application for video game characters. But you can see how natural the movements are. They're natural because they're, they're trained in a physics simulation so that they end up looking like, uh, you know, the way a body would actually move. And then they train on, uh, you, you know, you start with motion capture and a bunch of different atomic movements and then the then the, the you can use good old fashioned AI to combine the different atomic movements into very natural sequences of, of, of motion. So, and this would also work with robots, right? If your robot was cheap enough that you could afford to break it while you were sorting out the software, it would work with robots. So uh, the so the guts of the software we've known for a while how to do it. There's a lot of detailed work to do to get us there. And some you know as kind of a separate but related track. We, you know, as we were talking about earlier, we need to get, we need to get the, we need to figure out how to make a cheap body, a good body, you know, one that has the degrees of freedom that it can mimic what a human being does and then ramp that puppy up so that, so that all of this other work is justified. Because you're not building five robots and getting, you know, five humans worth of economic value out of it. You're building a million or a billion and you're getting millions or billions of, you know, people's worth of physical labor value out of it. So one of the questions I had, James, is, you know, when humans learn to walk, obviously we're much shorter. We weigh a lot less. Our bones are a lot squishier. And um, you know, the other thing is that we kind of learn how to walk in a more uh, or not how to walk, but how to fall in a more graceful way that's less painful. Um, you know, that's something that people who do something like parkour or gymnastics or, you know, these types of things that Part of the first part of their training is that they learn how to fall in a way that is going to do the least amount of damage. And they obviously operate uh, when they're training in an environment where things are a little bit more squishy to absorb some impact. And so I'm curious, what do you think the role of trying to make those types of accommodations for this initial learning experience for various robots? How do you think that that's going to play out? What's it going to look like practically? I think that when we actually get to scale, we, we probably won't be doing that stuff. Um, I think what, 
what we're what you're going to see is people are going to develop really powerful models where you you train them in simulation, you do the sim to real conversion, and they're and they're really good at dealing uh, at at the thing. The techniques aren't sufficiently refined right now that people want to bet lots of expensive robot bodies on it. And I think it's not a priority right now. Uh, the thing that you said about humans, I mean, humans learn, learn to walk, walk under much, I mean, it's a lot easier to learn to walk if you're if you're a foot tall or two feet tall. The, the taller you get, the harder it is. Like balance gets, because it like, you know, if uh, there's a scale dependency on this stuff. Like the bigger you get, the harder it is to do that kind of stuff. So learning to walk when you're small and then smoothly transitioning to being tall, like that, that's a good trick if you can pull it off. But I don't see people doing that with robots. I, people have suggested curriculum training for robots. And once upon a time when it seemed like um, curriculum training is basically where you give it something easy, then you give it a little harder, then you give it a little harder. So you're kind of guiding it toward doing something that's, that's more difficult. The same way that we do, you know, we, you know, when you, when you go to school, you learn easy stuff and then the hard stuff builds on the easy stuff. Uh, that I, people have tried using that idea. Uh, it's mostly useful in situations where you're trying to be really efficient with your compute for, for, for training your core model. Um, I, but I think the techniques are turning out to work so well that they're, that they're not going to need to accommodate they're not going to need to do that probably. And it's inconvenient to have all these, these extra steps. Like if you can just brute force, go straight to the target body, train in simulation, get it working really well, and then have a shim module that adapts your, that adapts, you know, what you learned in simulation to the actual physical body. Like that's easy, right? If you've got a straightforward way of generating the shim, the sim module. And if you can close the loop by, you know, you drop those neural networks into the body, you have it walk around a little bit and it refines the shim module you know, in the actual body. And then you constantly update the shim as the robot wears down as the bat, you know, because you get as a robot wear and tear on the robot and, you know, it, the bodies will change slightly as they, as they age. And in order for the robot to gracefully accommodate those changes to its body, as it does age, you want to, you want to constantly be measuring how is the body actually responding and slightly tuning that interface module so that you're so that you're always in, you know, so that it's always working pretty well. Like, lot very little things can have a big effect. You, uh, I think Scott, you had mentioned earlier about, uh, or maybe it was Hans, that like when you when you actuate the head, it makes walking a lot harder. Well, heads are heavy, right? And they change the center of gravity when they move back and forth. So it's a thing that you have to allow for. It has to be built into your model, and your model has to be able to do that. If you train a model that doesn't have a head, and then you put a head on the body. It's just going to like that. It's just going to throw itself off balance constantly because heads are heavy and they're up at the back, the, the wrong end. If you, you know, if you, if you shift some weight around at ankle level, it doesn't have as much impact as if you shift weight around on the top of this thing you're trying to balance. Yeah. And, and of course you, you see uh, chickens and stuff like that when they're walking, you know, they're moving their heads around sometimes to actually get the balance. They don't have arms um, and they, they don't have a waist. Right, right. So they end up having to do that. And it was sort of funny that the Tesla bot in the early days was falling over because the movement of the head, again, because they were accounting for that. Um, and it's an interesting thing you talk about the SHIB model because it seems like we have an internal SHIB model. And of course, we, we've talked about proprioception and how important that is. And you know, this, this famous trick that I always do, I can always close my eyes and always touch my nose. And I've been able to do that for years and years and years. Yet my body has changed. My muscles have atrophied. My joints are a little bit stiffer, everything else. I can still do it. And it's because every day when I get up, you know, my body is basically going through and it's recalibrating for the fact that I am wearing down. And that's the same thing as it's definitely going to happen to the and, and does ha happen to industrial robots and certainly it's going to happen to humanoid robots is they are going to wear, they're going to get out of calibration they're going to fall down. Something's going to get a little bit torqued or bent one way or the other. And you just kind of get up and then you kind of look at where your hand is, kind of like what RoboCop did, you know, and just do a few things, calibrate, and you're set to go. So it's it's not surprising that uh, a module or something like that would be in there. That, that That's definitely what I would expect. You're going to have to do it no matter what, because the robot is never going to be perfect. Even from day one, it's going to be a little bit off. And especially going from one bot to another, they still won't be exactly the same. So you're, you're always going to have to have that adjustment. And that's the reason why we have the sensors like eyes, because that's what allows you to constantly recalibrate and make sure you're on target. So even if your internal model 
says, oh, this is what I have to do to get to that target. And you miss it by a centimeter. The fact that you can see it, you know, up, move over a little bit, and now you're going to have it for sure. Mid-course correction, right? And and yep. it's it's an, and it's an absolute reference. But in human pro humans, robots actually, the robot bodies we build today actually have a big advantage in that their proprioception is much much better than human proprioception in terms of like how accurate individual pro like robot the you know the the actuators are building right now they have absolute position sensors in them whereas he, actually for human beings we have velocity and tension sensors and our brain integrates to get a, to get a, to get a you know a position out of that and that drifts over time like if you it's you were talking about being able to touch your nose if you close your eyes for a long time like if you if you wake up in the morning before you open your eyes and try to touch your nose it's actually really hard to get it on the first try right because the, the proprioception for your limbs has gone out of calibration overnight, right? It's the DC offset has drifted on that kind of stuff. And you, you, and this is a thing, you know, you put humans in a sensory isolation tanks or whatnot, and they can't tell what position your limbs are in after a couple of minutes, because there's no feedback senses to like, in, to, to correct that thing. I, uh, one of the reasons I am so confident that we are going to be able to make really cheap, really versatile robot bodies is because the stuff we're building today is massive overkill, right? When the neural networks are good enough to deal with the kinds of limitations that human bodies have in terms of like how crappy our proprioception is, and you put that on a robot, now you can, everything can be much simpler. Like the, we make them stiff now because, you know, if they if they have vibration modes and, and whatnot, or if they flex under load, like that actually makes a model all that much more complicated. And so, so we make robots stiff and we make actuators like really accurate because it makes the model simpler. When the models can deal with all that complexity, we can really dial down, you know, the tolerances and rigidity and power. We, you know, human, human bodies have all kinds of crazy mo modes, you know, dynamic modes. And we never have any problems with them because our software is so sophisticated. It, it actively suppresses all of the modes that we don't want to be expressed. And robot bodies, they'll be able to do all that stuff too. And it, like, if anything, we're learning it's much easier. Like we had, you know, if you'd asked ex experts 10 years ago, like how much compute power, how much sophistication it was going to take to be able to do the kinds of things that animals can do, the bar would have been really high. But if you look at the size of the neural networks, I mean, the neural networks for controlling those those little dancing figures and whatnot, they are tiny. They're microscopic compared to large language models. It's hard to get them trained up, but once you get them trained up, it doesn't take much of them. It, it, a very, very small models, very, very small amounts of compute can can get can run that model on the body and get really good performance out of it. So I mean, we're learning, if anything, we're learning that like once you get it down. It like you can crank these puppies out in la in large volume at low cost, and they're going to be really impressive in the real world. We hope you enjoyed part one of this Optimus Gen 2 deep dive conversation with James Dauma and Scott Walter. If you enjoyed this conversation, stay tuned for part two coming next week, where we discuss the current capability of Optimus Gen 2 and the changes that we expect to see in both software and hardware over time as Tesla creates a more and more capable humanoid robot. Thanks for watching and have a great day.